So we're going to be continuing today talking about VLIW, or Very Long Instruction Word Processors. Um, this is an alternative way to exploit parallelism in a uh, processor, but instead of doing scheduling dynamically, as it, we've been talking about in out-of-order processors and superscalars, we're going to look at ways to do it statically in the compiler, and then architectures which can exploit that. But let's now start talking about very long instruction word processors. So we've been talking about the superscalar processors. The superscalar processors have a fair amount of complexity in them, especially out of order processors. But where does this complexity come from? And can we remove all that complexity? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So here I show a picture where I have the issue width of a superscalar processor, and uh, we represent that as W. And then we have the lifetime of an instruction. So that sort of gives you a matrix of things in flight in the processor. Now these may be sitting in your instruction queue. Um, we're not going to count if they actually, let's say, get all the way to the reorder buffer, because by the time they get all the way to the reorder buffer, um, they probably, depending on how you build your processor, um, you probably don't need to continually check those against the other instructions that are coming. You've already broadcast that back to either your reservation station or your instruction queue to issue few further instructions. But if you think about the complexity here of what you're really doing when you try to go issue an instruction, you're trying to take these in-flight instructions and you have to look up basically against them or in your instruction window all of the instructions when they complete against basically all the other instructions, all the registers. Um, now we build some structures that make this so you don't have to complete all to all check. So example structures that we create to help out with this. Um, first of all, the scoreboard, instead of keeping track of where everything is, sort of our original design where we had uh, portions of, or which register destinations sort of flowing down the pipe and then we did all to all compare. Instead, we just keep track of the location and latency of the most recent write to a register. And it turns something from a all to all compare into an index lookup based on the register. So that's a little bit nicer. But if you think about what's happening in the issue queue, we're still doing a, um, as an instruction retires, it's going to basically broadcast the registers that get completed against the instruction queue and try to wake up instructions and see which ones are ready to go. And that roughly, as I said, scales, scales like this, because you're going to be retiring multiple instructions per cycle. And you know, let's say you have a bunch of stuff in the, the instruction queue. You're going to have to check against all of those. And this can get painful. Um, let's, let's take a look at first sort of the complexity of this for uh, in-order machine. So in-order machine is, is not so bad. Um, L is kind of the pipeline length. You have your uh, uh, width, but you just basically have to have a scoreboard to figure this out. And as we said, that's an indexed-based structure. Now, when you start to go out of order, you, you start to have this sort of complexity of all of the results that come back have to be broadcast against either, if you have a distributed instruction queue, all the reservation stations, or if you have a, a single instruction queue, you have to check against all of the possible instructions to go issue. And what's interesting is, one of the big challenges of building these structures is not actually quite what you'd think. It's, there's an interesting challenge that you have too many things that could wake up in one cycle. So let's say you have a single instruction, or let's say all of the instructions in your instruction queue are waiting on register 5 to become valid. All of a sudden, instruction, uh, some add, let's say, writes register 5 and, and it, it enters the reorder buffer, so it gets to the end of the pipe. Well, now all of a sudden you have to wake up all these instructions and choose the some instructions that are the width of your machine that can go issue. Also, you need, still need to make sure that you can uh, satisfy all of the different requirements in the machine of functional unit mixes. So if you have, you know, say, two, two adds, uh, two multiplies, and one load and store, you can't just go pick randomly from there. You need to pick exactly that mix. So this becomes a big mess of combinational logic. And this is why front ends of processors can actually, and out of order processors can start to get longer and longer. 
uh, you get more and more stages in there to do this. And as we talked about last time in like the Pentium 4, there's actually multiple stages out in front there to be able to do this. And unfortunately, you even have to pipeline that, which makes this even more challenging. <clears throat> so, so roughly, um, if you look at sort of the out-of-order control logic here, it's sort of growing somewhere between the width squared to the width cubed. And this is, this is not, not very good. Um, sometimes there are a couple uh, circuit level tricks that can help you. So um, if you go look at people who actually do full custom logic for designs of processors, they'll make something that they call pickers. Um, and what a picker is, is it's actually a, instead of using straight combinational logic to go compute what instructions are ready to go uh, execute, you'll instead have a much more analog circuit in there, where you'll basically have some custom analog circuit there, which is almost like a CAM or a content addressable memory, but it's not quite a CAM. It's more of a uh, circuit which will choose what instruction is ready to go, and it is typically you want to have some heuristic that is the oldest instruction. This is to prevent deadlocks. So you don't really want to issue arbitrarily instructions. Uh, arbitrary instructions, you want to issue the oldest instruction because you want to make forward progress in the machine. So what I'm trying to get at here is this is a lot of hardware complexity. It's growing as the width of the machine. And some things actually make this even worse. So here, I have a little note here that as you increase the width of your machine, let's say you have a, you had a three wide machine and all of a sudden you want to go to, let's say, a four or five wide machine. Typically, you need also a larger instruction queue or instruction window to look across in order to find enough parallelism to keep the machine busy. So as you go wider, you also typically have to uh, make the machine sort of deeper or at least make your instruction queue deeper to find enough parallelism to feed your functional units. Hmm, that's not good. So as this causes the, you know, our, uh, these sort of blow up factors here. And you can build these things, but they're hard. So are there alternatives? Yes. But let's, before we, we move on to these alternatives, let's look at the sort of complexity of this in a real processor. So here we have a, a die photo or die micrograph of the MIPS R10000 processor. This was used in uh, workstations by SGI for many years. It's a uh, real out-of-order superscalar. And one of the interesting things is if you go look at how much area is dedicated just to control logic, it's pretty substantial. So in this processor here, here's our actual data path. It's relatively modest. Cache, instruction cache, data cache, those are pretty big structures. You can see those. <clears throat> we have, uh, you know, some other, let's see, the data tags, instruction tags, the TLB, you know, those are big, biggish sort of things. And then all this stuff here is quite large. Let's look at what's inside of here. We have uh, sort of next instruction sorts of things. We have the free list for the uh, we had talked about this, right? We talked about the free list for the uh, which registers uh, free, if you will, to reuse in your out-of-order processor. We have a big thing that just does register renamer. Uh, uh, we have different queues here. So this is a distributed instruction queue or a uh, uh, distributed reservation station processor. So there's one for just uh, address calculation instructions, integer instructions, and floating point instructions. But what's interesting to see here is the, prof the, the, the percentage of this die that's actually doing compute, let's say this integer data path, the floating point data path, the floating point multiplier, is sort of pales in comparison to all the overhead. So th this is just sort of to get this, get this idea across. Another problem with uh, out of order superscalers or superscalers in general is thinking about how do we express parallelism? And I alluded to this in uh, a previous lecture, but it's worth repeating. So let's, let's take a look at what happens for code, sequential codes on a out-of-order superscalar. We start off here with some piece of C code. We put it into our fancy superscalar compiler. 
<clears throat> that generates some sort of data flow graph and probably also con control flow graph inside the compiler. So it's sort of instructions, there's dependencies between the different instructions. And the compiler right now is trying to find independent operations because it's going to try to come up with a schedule. Unfortunately, you have to come up with a sequential schedule because the instruction sets on sequential processors require you to come up with some order, even though it's very possible that there is uh, no one perfect order. It's also possible that you know, you're sort of over-constraining the problem here. Why are we coming up with, with some, some ordering when we don't need to? But, you know, in our, in our sequential ISA, we have to come up with that. We write it out to disk somehow, or, you know, save a file with this, this code. And then we have to go and actually try to execute it. And what's funny, that I just get a chuckle out of this, is the compiler knew what the dependencies were. And then we have our superscalar processor here, which goes and takes apart the sequential code and tries to reorder the instructions and tries to find parallelism in the instruction sequence. But the compiler knew that. But we had like a breakdown here in the middle that we just were not, not able to express that between the compiler and the processor. Compiler knew about the parallelism. Compiler knew about all the ordering and the requirements. It had to come up with some sequential code sequence, provides it to the processor. The processor takes those, those, that sequential code sequence back apart, does out of order scheduling like we did on the exam in the midterm, and it's going to, you know, we build a bunch of hardware here, which has high complexity, as we were talking about in the combination of logic, checking uh, the dependencies. And then it comes up with some schedule. Um, this is done via our reservation stations or our instruction queues, um, and something's going to fire, and it's going to come up with some schedule, and it's going to execute those instructions by preserving um, read after write dependencies. And hopefully, if our superscalar processor is fancy, we have some registry name where we can break some of the other dependencies also, the write after write and the write after read dependencies, and come up with some schedule that's high performance. Now, it's, there's no guarantee that this schedule is what the compiler would have done if it was smarter, um, or if it could somehow express parallelism across this interface. But, you know, it does something. And what's, what's funny about this is there's a whole lot of power that's being wasted, it's a whole lot of uh, effort that's being wasted in the processor, there's a lot of effort of the designers of the processor that is, are effectively designing all these circuits to take apart the sequential code sequence and do something useful with it. So it's a lot of, lot of work being done there. Is there a better way? 